starting with where we stopped last time. So we talked about screws and uh, we mentioned that we have something called constructs. And when we have constructs, it means that you have a plate and screw at the same time. So we have something called non-locked constructs and we have something called locked constructs. So those are important. The idea behind locking and not non-locking is that if you have a plate, so let's say this is a plate here, right? And you're trying to uh, fix a fractured bone below, uh, be below this thing, and that's fractured. If the screw head was outside, um, so it should be like this, right? Uh, that's called non-locked. If you have an opening inside the plate where the screw head is going in, placed inside it, that's called locked construct. And each one of them has their advantages, advantages and also the usages. And we're going to talk about them today. So the non-locked constructs, um, they're tra traditional plating, right? And that's what usually people um, use when someone has a fractured long bone or in the spinal cord. So spy, sp screws not locked to plate, the head is out, and uh, it generates axial uh, screw force. Now, the axial screw force, you know, axial means along the axis of the screw. Axial screw force means that there are a lot of forces going down, pushing down on the bone itself uh, to hold it, to hold the bone. So you, you are compressing on this location on the, in the bone. You probably have multiple of these screws. You will be pressing on the entire surface of the bone. And do you remember what is the part of bone, that what we call that surface, the area of the bone? or the tissue of the bone, the periosteum, and it's filled with stem cells. So when you push on it, actually you're damaging it. Two, there are there is friction as well. So that also damage that periosteum. So you're losing the ability to heal, the, for bone to heal because of that. Uh, so you have compression force uh, and you have friction force. And those are things that you don't want to have actually, especially, especially if you have um, someone with osteoporosis uh, or diabetic because their bone is weak, right? So you don't want to squash on the bone um, or if it's cancellous bone. That's that's not a good idea. So non-locked constructs, usually they're used for people who have healthy bone and we care about the um, axial force to the, to the, to the bone. And the, the other thing, the good thing about these non-locked constructs is that you can align the screw with an angle. So for example, you can have, uh, let's say, a screw head like this, and you can get the, the screw this way. So the non-locked construct can allow us to do this angulation, uh, but it's tricky when it comes to friction and compression. Now the locked constructs uh, are the one that they have the opening. So you will have like this, right, a plate, uh, and the screw is going to be housed in it. And the, the problem with these is that, um, so the screw is locked to plate, and that's called internal fixation on the plate. And, um, and not friction force, we don't have much friction, but bending and shear forces across the screw neck. So in the non-locked construct, you're probably damaging the bone but with the locked construct, you're actually damaging the screw itself. So you're stressing the screw on the neck because the plate will try to move and the bone is moving. So everything is actually pressure pushing on the screw neck itself, right? Um, now, this is good for when you, again, when you don't want to have a lot of pressure on the bone and um, it reduces friction. Now. The disadvantage of the locked constructs is that I'm losing the ability to for angular fixation because it will it will force me to go in one direction. And the other thing that's important, orthopedic surgeons like to have a feel of actually of the bone and the screw being fixed. With the locked construct, they lose that feeling because they have to put the screw in the housing where it's, it's hold there and they keep screwing until it stops. So they don't have a feeling of how far or deep they went into the bone like the non-locked constructs. 
So if you are working with an orthopedic surgeon and you're, let's say, working for a company like Striker and you are trying to provide them with plates and screws for a specific surgery, you need to know these kind of information and to help them decide which one they need to use. Now, non-locked construct, the advantages of it allow screw angulation, catch bone fragments, so especially because you can do the alignment or the angulation, you can bring bone fragments to the bone. So for example, if you have a bone piece like this, right, and a piece went out here, uh, yeah, so that we, we, we lost one piece, you can have a, a screw with an angle, right, and bring it into the bone itself uh, because of the angulation. Now, the problems with it or disadvantages, if external load, you know, if there's any loading externally affects the plate itself or the construct, you'll have friction load uh, and the plate may slip uh, because the head is outside of the plate. Increased uh, force on screw neck lead to pull out sometimes because the head is out, any external forces on the plate construct might it will go, go, go out slip. It's not secured in, in a housing. And if for osteoporotic bone, start with very low axial force and friction force. So it, we are not going to be able to, uh, it's, it's, it's very, the osteoporotic bone is weak and spongy. Uh, so axial forces, they can slip easy from there. And the friction forces is because of the plate uh, there and the pressure. Now the locked cost, uh, plating, load is mainly in bending, less in axial pull, right? Um, so because it's in housed in its location, we are not worried about it coming out from by axial force, right? Coming out. But bending is a problem. Uh, if you do, there's a lot of bending on it. Uh, less risk for pull out of screw. And osteoporotic weak bone, better not relying on axial load uh, of a screw into bone. So we like the locked plating for osteoporotic and weak bone uh, more. The disadvantages of this one, fixed angle construct. We don't have angulation. We can't vary that angle as well as loss of surgical feeling. That's what I was telling you about the physicians. They would like to feel how much, how deep they, and how strong the bone is uh, for subject. Okay, now the plate position and, and construct. Now, here's the thing. Where do you think bone is weaker, on the compression side or the bending side? Bending. The bending. So we put the, whenever we have a surgery, we put the plates on the bending side of the, the bone. So on tension side um, and load you know, sharing, that's important. You know, load sharing is good, but shielding stress, uh, that's a bad thing. So if you have, let's say, a, a, a plate and that plate is taking the entire load rather than the bone itself the bone will osteoclast will start resolving the bone uh, that's called stress shielding uh, but load sharing is good so that's tension and plate uh, tension band plate principle uh, how where do you put it so tension lateral side and the compression we put the plate on the tension side that's our 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 uh, now, communicative fractures. No, communicative fractures mean the, the entire bone, the long bone, is completely disassociated. It's a complete fracture between the two. Uh, no bone in contact. So all loads to the plate. A lot of bending uh, stresses on it, uh, and that's you know the theory clo close to loading center reduced the moment. Yeah, because the bone is completely fractured you need to have something to hold the bone, to share the load with the bone itself. And the thing is that we'd like to preserve, so the, um, yeah. And that is if you have, let's say you have a, an opening, a complete, um, you know, this is what we call critical size defect, which mean I have a piece of the bone gone, actually, uh, and I, we can't replace it. So we either put fillings bone cement there or other, you know other you know um, osteo inductive and conductive materials to fill this um, critical size defect now if you have it on the other side if you want to put it on the other side 
on the compression side, it's only to protect that filling or cement to be there. And usually people put on both sides actually in that case, uh, the plating. And that helped preserve vascul va vasculature. Um, so if you're worried about the blood vessels in one side of the preosteum, you decide on the compression side, not on the bending side of the bone or the tensile side of the bone. Right, uh, now we talked about compression, right? And uh, compression is bad actually if you want to preserve the periosteum, uh, that thin layer on the bone, uh, sort of, because it's filled with um, stem cells. So we have something called compression plates. It applies compression to the fracture site, um, does the over uh, bending and loading, which mean, so if you have two pieces of bone that are dislocated and you want, oh, and you want to make them get close to each other, push them. So what we do is that we take a plate. Um, usually plates are metal, right? But we bend them outward, right? And then co connect them to the bone. So when you, when they are released, they press, press the bone inward. So you will have it like this. So this is, let's say, the bone, right? Fractured bone. You take a plate and you make it like this. You bend it, right? And then you put connect it to the bone and you release it. Because of some elasticity, it will push inward so that the two pieces of bone are compressed. And that accelerates healing, actually. And that's called compressive uh, compression plates. Uh, eccentric screw loading, a dynamic loading. You know the concentric and eccentric? So concentric, uh, you're trying to pull a load, but the load is not allowing you. For example, so let's say I'm doing flexion, right? And if I have a load that I can comprehend, I can move it this way. What happened to my muscle is something called concentric loading, right? Now, if I have, I don't know, 50 pounds and I'm unable to pull it to do the flexion, so I'm trying, but it is going down. That's called eccentric. So that's against what you want to do. And that's what happened with the compression plates. They tried to pressure the bone inward, right? Now, we have things called neutralization protection plates, and we do this uh, if you want to protect a piece of the bone that you think it's going to be damaged, especially in the ankle, when you have really those important joints. So act as a mechanical link between the fragments, and uh, not to produce inter-fragmentary compression. We don't need compression, we need protection. And used to protect the screw fixation, especially in bone grafting. Now, bone grafting is filling um, a critical size defect that you lost a piece of bone and you put it inside there. So here, uh, see these are the buttress plates. Uh, that's for the ankle. And you can see how they will have locked, right? This is locked because there are openings for the screws to get inside there. And the angles, the design. So you'll have a lot of designs and people come up with way a lot, a lot of different uh, ways of how to make these. Um, Plates. So, uh, most common in uh, metaphyseal uh, fractures support the meta or the epiphyseal area. So we are getting closer to the edges of the bone, right? Which mean which mean we are going to the cancellous bone, not the com compact bone in the middle. Now this is where you need protection uh, most of the time because the bone there is a little bit uh, weak and you don't want to damage the uh, metaphyseal and the epiphyseal areas where bone grow, continue to grow, especially for kids. So that's where you need protection, when you get away from the cortical bone to the cancellous bone. OK, distributes uh, force over a wide area. That's why we have it big, right, uh, the area? Uh, because you don't want them to be just aligned in the middle, the screws. And what you do also uh, maintains proper location of bone and reduce induced uh, over impaction to protect it. And this is, I think, a schematic that present that um, you do overbending or preloading of the plate. So you preload the plate and then you put it on the bone and it's going to do elasticity, uh, compress it. And can be done in operation room. And that's what we like from, we train orthopedic surgeons how to bend before they put it in the, sur in the surgery. So you get these plates. Uh, 
and then you get another one and so so you bend it it should be the other way you bend it you put it there and then it will compress on the, the other one right so eccentric screws loading placements and that's compression plating also we have something called dynamic compression plates um, and the thing about dynamic compression plates is that you can bend it right to do compression uh, you have also um, housing for the screws but also you can get angles with it with these you can create some angle angulation with that and the beautiful part is that at the bottom you have something like this so you don't ha see this area so you are not touching the bone all the way so there are some spaces that you're not compressing the bone to protect the periosteum so we can decide which one and how far those are to protect the periosteum and that's called dynamic compression plates um, all unlimited contact plating as well that's what we call we would like to limit their contact with the periosteum to protect that periosteum so it improves vascularity because what we found that there's a lot of small capillaries and blood vessels in the periosteum to protect to keep uh, the, the stem cells alive if you pressure those you are taking the blood away because of the pressure so you're pressuring the blood away and that is damaging the periosteum itself and preserve bone circulation and that's called limited contact uh, plating for periosteal healing or for screw placement so you have traditional with angulation traditional with compression and angulation and you have locking with tapered heads so instead of doing the screwing, you can just hit on those heads to get them in, the screws. Uh, limits over uh, tightening screw. So that's also another thing. See these threads there? One of the problems that physicians will, you know, used to have is that if it's locking, they will keep pushing inward and the screw actually gets into the bone as well, the head. So that's called over tightening the screws. But now because we have these threads, it limits the over tightening. So it stops the head from going down. Um, another cool idea of how they're doing these things for the place screws. If you are interested in this field, you probably need to know, you will be focusing on, you know, you know, plates, screw construct for the spine or plate screw construct for the, um, you know, foot and ankle or for the long bone. And then you will know all of the different types and the, you know for the company that you'll be working with and you will be helping physician you know orthopedic surgeon how to do the surgery uh, now one of the other fixation tools that can be done mostly we use it in human but it's mostly for animal experiments and animal research uh, it's the intramedullary rods the Kirshner wires that's what i did in those so this picture from my phd dissertation so this is what I did for the rats, uh, the diabetic rats. So we do the fracture in the middle, and then uh, we put one of these wires into the bone to make the bone fixed. So we didn't use plates because their bone is small. Uh, I didn't want to do the surgery with the, with the plates. So we had these K wires, uh, and that's called the mid-diaphyseal fracture in the middle uh, was created, and we apply treatment for, the, for these rats uh, during the surgery with a you know material and the release you know that releases proteins over a long period of time and then you see the bone healing so you can tell which one do you think is the one the best one that healed see right see how much this is dense bone uh, so a was um, no treatment at all so and that's i think it was four weeks after surgery no uh, diabetic rats it didn't heal at all uh, now this one here we just gave them the carrier which is the material without any drugs um, still having an opening it didn't do anything now this is a low dose of the the pdf plate derived growth factor right this is a high dose of the pdf so this is something we see continuously see in medicine if you give a drug more than it should be the dose it actually um, hinders the healing it's a bad bad thing it has a lot of negative effects. So one of the things that pharmace pharmaceutical engineering is actually identifying how much of the drug is actually effective 
to be placed. And we keep seeing this all the time. Small dosages are way much better than large dosages of drugs. And that's where people have start having side effects.